Welcome back to another video and today we are going to be continuing on with the lore of the world of Hydaelyn and today we are finally moving on to the third of the three city-states that we start off with, Gridania. So as you know, Linta Lamensa is the land by the ocean and Udal is the jewel in the desert. Gridania here is the very forest regions of the Black Shroud. Nestled amidst the thick foliage of the sacred forest, the woodland city-state of Gridania rules over the lands of the Black Shroud. The Black Shroud is, as it's known to outsiders, or the Twelve's Wood, which is known by those who actually live within the wood. It was constructed almost entirely from timber spelled in the blessing of the area's elementals. Gridania has also gained fame for its water wheels, which harness the power of rivers flowing into the jaded flood and drive the city's industry. All right, so just like with the others, we're just going to go over just the very basics that we know about the city as well as a brief history of it and some of the major landmarks that we have in the city itself. So let's go ahead and start off here with the flag or the banner that we have for Gridania. It's the white lily upon Gridania standard signifies mankind's first congress with the elementals, while the golden field represents the lands filled with the elementals' power. The entwined serpents originate from the ancient subterranean city of Gamora and proclaim the goodwill and unity of Elizen and Hure in raising Gridania. And the motto for the city is, Woods will be done. So that also signifies how devoted the people are to the woods, to nature, and especially to the elementals. If you're wondering what the elementals are, we will cover all of that too. But basically, they're like forest spirits, like protectors of the wood, they live inside the trees, they're made entirely of ether, and kind of their word is law. So they have a lot of power and they have to kind of work together with mankind in order to be able to create the forest, make it as peaceful as possible. The thing is, elementals don't really talk normally. I mean, sometimes they are able to speak, but usually it's through the process of either the seed seers or those they consider to be hearers who can at least hear the whispers of what the elementals are saying. And they kind of have to figure out what they're saying and then kind of pass that on to mankind. And speaking of the hearers, uh, their government is kind of based off them. The rule of Gridania falls to the Seed Seer Council. It's a body composed of chosen officials known as hearers. These are conjurers who are able to communicate with the elementals and they decide the course of the city-state through discussion and consensus. Around the time of the Calamity, however, Gridania's fate was so uncertain that Kane Sena, the elder Seed Seer and head of the council, assumed direct control. At present, she continues to preside over all affairs of state. So even though Gridania does have its own kind of council, like a democracy, uh, she's kind of the one who's in charge of all of that. And yes, she is known as the Elder Seed Seer. So Elder Seed Seer Kane Sena. The ruling body of the council is led by the Elder Seed Seer, and the Seed Seer Council is made up of the heroes who rise in the most talented of Grijana's conjurers. So everyone here is able to heal. They are able to hear the voices of the forest, so to speak. Some probably better than others, but together they decide the best course to be able to take to help guide their people through tough times. As for their religion, like with the other city-states, they have their own patron deity. In this case, they have Nofika, the tender of soils and the goddess of the good harvest. While she does not want for devotees in the other lands, only in the Twelves Wood does one find the curious belief that the elementals are sprung from her essence. These beings are at once the force of the forest's vitality and its defenders, ever ready to purge invaders from amongst the trees. Their presence is felt most keenly in the everyday life of Gridanians, and many of them have festivals and rituals performed in honor of the elementals. Again, they're like forest spirits. They protect the forest, and so the people feel it's their duty to protect the elementals. Now, Gridania is also home to six different guilds. Three of them are for combat, which are lancers, archers, and conjurers. Two of them are for crafting, which is leather workers and carpenters. And the last one is for gathering, which is for botanists. The industry here is mostly forestry. The sounds of chopping and sawing can be heard in certain groves throughout the entire Black Shroud. Woodcutters fill timber only where directed and act in accordance with plans that are drawn up by hearers in negotiation with the elementals. 
So the loggers here are very, very careful over which trees that they're allowed to cut down. If they cut down a tree that the elementals did not want cut down, then they can face some serious consequences. So loggers tend to avoid digesting the forest at its natural bounty and even go as far as to plant a seedling for every tree that they cut down. Which I kind of like that whole idea. But Gridania is famous for four major industries. We have carpentry, farming, hunting, and leather work. So carpentry, probably the most obvious, with the quantity and quality of timber in the forest, it is natural that Gridanians would take to working with wood. Indeed, there is precious little they cannot fashion from everyday goods to armaments to building to riverboats. The pride of Gridania's carpentry is the water wheel, which has no peer in design or craftsmanship. However, they're also pretty good with farming, despite the fact that they live in the forest, so there's probably very limited farmland that they can use. But over time, people have abandoned gathering the Twelvewood's bounty for the table in favor of cultivating crops. Orchards can be found in clear thickets throughout the Shroud, and Gridania citizens share large gardens with the city itself. We also have a fair amount of hunting to ensure that no man is too greedy in his take, Hunters who pursue game in the woods must abide by the regulations of the Trapper's League. The Leagues are also working to combat poachers whose actions risk upsetting the balance of the forest. So of course there are going to be some people who do try to take more than that is given and that's why they are putting in like so many restrictions. After all, people just take what they want, there won't be anything left for future generations so that's why they're so strict on how much they take from the forest. And that also includes the art of leatherworking. The artisans of Gridania can use the finest hides and bones that hunters can provide and craft works of such quality as to garner the admiration of the entire realm. They ensure they never go to waste and any part of the animal will be used as part as almost like a work of art because no part is thrown away. The Gridanians know the blessings bestowed upon them by the elementals and they heed well their will. Behind this lies a fear of disturbing the peace of the Twelves Wood and being cast from the forest by enraged elementals, just as the Exali once were. Yet Gridanians have earned a reputation as stubborn amongst the other city-states of Eorzea, as they can be so unyielding in their commitment to the forest's laws as to appear unadaptable and brittle. Which is very true, especially if you first come to Gridania and you see that the people tend to be very cold and unwelcoming of outsiders, kind of like how the Ishgardians were. For their diets, the bounty of the Black Shroud graces the Gridania table from fruits to vegetables to the meats of forest game, yet there are few who feel this fare lacks in flavor. As animal husbandry is forbidden, at least the creatures upset the woods balance, dairy goods are few and far between. Instead, Gridanians drink Mutoin Tonic. It's a concoction brewed from beans of the same name. In fact, many of the products made from fermented Mutoi are known as the Gridanians' delicacy the realm over. So, the Order of the Twin Adder is comprised of four main units, then there's a fifth, smaller one. Forging and crafting falls to the Blue Badgers. It's a unit of engineers and sappers that recruits from local disciplines of the Hand and Land Guild. Next are the Red Otters, an elite combat unit that draws select lancers, archers, and conjurers from their respective guilds. Whereas those who are still young who wish to serve Gridania enlist in the White Wolves as combat troops. The fourth is the Black Boars, provide logistics and supports for other units. Their ranks are kind of formed for men and women who have retired from the ranks of the Wood Whalers and God's Quiver. And finally, we have the Yellow Serpents. They are a unit consisting solely of adventurers. They provide various aid to the other four when called upon. Uh, but all of these are coordinated from the command center known as the Adder's Nest. The Wood Whalers and God Quiver have always cooperated with the Order, but initially maintained independence in their command chain. Heavy losses at the Battle of Cartonneau, however, prompted Gridania to reorganize its Grand Company, thus the Whalers and Bows are officially ushered into the Twin Adder after the Calamity. So this here is just a very basic outline of how their military is kind of set up. So you have the Elder Seed Seer and we have the Seed Seer Council. So at the top of command, of course, is Elder Seed Seer Kane Sena. She's able to get advice and recommendations from the Seed Seer Council, so that's something completely separate. But the entire Twin Adder serves underneath her. And the Adder's Nest can also be separated into two major ranks. We have the main units, which of course is the Blue Badgers, the White Wolves, the Red Otters, the Black Boars, and the Yellow Serpents. And they're tasked with defending the forest from within and without respectively. Gridania's Wood Whalers and the God Quivers have grown adept at chasing foes, 
through the trees and warding off Ixali war balloons. However, both forces are ill-prepared to venture too far from outside the Black Shroud. By means of recruiting well-trained adventurers, the Yellow Serpents exact precisely to overcome this foible. In the early days, Serpent Commander Quincoro Lieutenant, an adventurer himself, led the unit until the Battle of Cartineau. Unfortunately, he could never recover from the horrors he had seen and was discharged from duty. Therefore, Vorsile Heliox climbed from the ranks of the second Serpent Commander to take the reins as the High Commander. And then there's also the Ranger units, such as the God's Quiver and the Wood Whaler. So they're separate, but at the same time they work together. Uh, the Ranger units kind of supervise the main units. Alright, so let's have a look here at the main leader, of course, is Kane Sena. So Kane Sena serves as head of the Seatseer Council, the central governing body presiding over affairs within the city-state. As is common amongst those born into the prestigious Sena line, she was blessed by the Twelve with the gift of prophecy. Her visions hauntingly clear and detailed. Before she was even six, she had predicted a devastating fire and even a locust infestation, earning her the position of a hearer at a remarkably young age. After rising to become the elder seed seer, she left Gridania to live in the forest with her siblings, where she served the city-state by communicating with the elementals. As the number of rumors regarding unnatural phenomena began to swell, however, Kane Sena was left with no choice but to return to the city-state, whereupon she oversaw the creation of the Order of the Twin Adder. A woman who has earned the respect of her people by always letting her actions speak as loud as her words, her affable Demeter befiles her bravery. At the Battle of Cartineau, she wielded the white magic of the Paja to save the lives of friend and foe alike. This remarkable display of compassion has won her renown throughout the realm. In her 28 summers, Kane Sena has developed a fondness for Moon Tuan Brew and is surprisingly adept at the dances of Mughal kind. She also wields the weapon known as Clostrum. Within the Guardian Tree, eldest sentry of the Twelve's Wood dwells the Great One. It is said this elemental shook free a bow from its canopy, which was taken and carved into the legendary staff, Quastra. This weapon name comes from the word meaning key, as it is able to dispel all wards set by the elementals. Now, Kane Sena is the oldest of three siblings. Amongst Gridania's conjurers, those elite few who can sense the voices of the elementals are known as the hearers. We talked about them. As leaders to these hearers, the Seed Seers are reportedly the mightiest men and women of their age, and called to duty by the Great One, the eldest of the Twelve's Wood ruling spirits. As one might expect, almost all Seed Seers are Paija, attuned as they are to the will of the Elementals. While it is rare for more than one Seed Seer to exist in any given period, History holds numerous exceptions to this rule, such as today in present day, for example, where Gridania has three seed seers, Kane Sena, Raya O Sena, and Arun Sena. So they're all siblings, they're all born of the Sena line. But Kane is definitely the oldest, and so she's the elder seed seer. And while they are kind of on the same level, just a little bit below her are her two younger siblings, Raya O and Arun. So they're all part of the Seed Seer Council, and the Council is a forum for hearers to share what they have learned from the Elementals, and they decide matters of state. In effect, the Council is the highest power in the land and the arbiter of Gridanian law. One must wonder, therefore, why they conduct their business at the Lotus Stand, an outside area with no roof. Scholars contend that this is for the benefit of the Elementals, so they may watch the proceedings. While decisions are put to a vote, policies sometimes reflect the will of the elementals more strongly than the option of the hearers. Following the calamity, however, the system has changed. Faced with the challenges of the Garlean Empire and rebuilding, Gridania would scarcely afford time spent in debate. Thus, the council was vested in its full power in Kane Sena until such a time as the danger is passed. So that's the reason why she's pretty much in control right now. Usually it has to be a mutual decision between all the council members, but because of the threat of the Garlean Empire, all rule has kind of been pushed onto Kane Sena, who would have the overall decision. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at Gridania right now and some of the landmarks that we have scattered throughout the city. So the city itself is divided into two separate parts. We have New Gridania and we have Old Gridania, but we're going to start ahead with New Gridania first. By the shores of the Jaded Flood, which is the main river that we have flowing through Gridania, New Gridania lies in the south of the city. Due to a vast effort to expand and improve some 200 years past, its structures are, as the name would imply, somewhat newer than others. So let's go ahead and look at this new part here, and we have several different 
area. So let's go ahead and start at the Blue Badger Gate. So this is usually the gate that most outsiders are able to come through in. And you can actually see the Blue Badger right on top of it. So one amongst the great gates of Gridania, the Blue Badger Gate takes its name from the mythical creatures that stand guard over the four cardinal directions. It opens onto the Mistdale Bridges, named for the founder of the Lancers Guild, and leads to the Central Shroud. So it's usually, I guess, the main gate. So this is the main gate that most people tend to go through, especially if you're a brand new adventurer and you're first coming to the game. Now moving over here, we have the Roost. So it's run by the innkeep named Boyle the Bold and manned by his lawyer servant, Anatonet. The Roost is the most famous of all of Gridania's hostilities, with an airship landing for the Highwind Skyways. One can reliably find all manner of people under its roof, from adventurers to travelers to merchants. So the Roost here is the main inn that you have in Gridania. Also inside here, we have the Carlene Canopy, which is also the Adventurer's Guild. Nestled within the roost, the Carlin Canopy is Gridania's foremost tavern. The establishment's namesake, Flower, apparently holds some sentimental value for the owner, Mother Mioni. The Canopy also allows the Adventurous Guild a counter, making it a convenient meeting place for travelers. So this place is important because if you choose to start your adventure off in Gridania, this is the first place where you kind of get settled in, where you sign up as an adventurer in the Adventurous Guild. And you actually come here quite a lot over the game. Bit moving on to what we have here as Fagaga's Gift. It's an immigrant shipwright originally drew up the plans for this great water wheel. His intent was to build it in thanks for the kindness shown him by the minder of the water wheel. Unfortunately, the shipwright took ill and perished before he could turn his idea into reality. His daughter, for whom the wheel is named, labored mightily for ten years to see his dream fulfilled. Today it stands as a proud landmark of Gridania and its unique enclosed design of the blades is recognized as an engineering wonder. So you can actually see a great deal about this like whenever you're going through at least this part of Gridania. So not only is it a wonder to look at because it really is a beautiful structure to really witness, it actually helps power some of the guilds such as the Carpenters Guild. Speaking of which, we have the Oak Atrium. It's home to the Carpenters Guild, and the Oak Atrium houses both sawmills and this workshop. It draws from the power of Degaga's gift. The sawmill then slices through timber with astonishing speed, much to the satisfaction of the Gridanian workers. So the water wheel powers several of the guilds. I'm pretty sure mostly the Carpenters Guild, but it does seem to provide power both to the Carlin Canopy, to the Roost, and basically to most places that you see in New Gridania. Now if we go to the other side of the Carpenters Guild, we have the Acorn Orchard. Just behind the Oak Atrium, the Acorn Orchard is a playground for Gridania's young and its young at heart. Crafted by the very best of Gridania's carpenters, the area's many playthings allow children to feel with their own hands the grain of the fine forest woods and thereby learn their properties. Interesting way to go about it, and you can often see young children playing through here. It's just the basic playground that you have here in Gridania, which is really unique because you don't see that in the other city-states. Moving on to this quiet little corner that we have in New Gridania, we have the Quiver's Hold. Now this wooden citadel is at the central seat of the God's Quiver, and serves as their headquarters when watching for incursions of primals and foreign forces alike. It's from here that orders are sent out to each of the city's watch spires, as well as those scattered throughout the Black Shroud. Quiver's Hold also permits the Archer's Guild to use its practice butts, and on any given day, Quivermen can be seen loosening shafts side by side with Guild Archers. So that's actually a clever way to go about this. It's the headquarters for the God's Quiver, which is one of the organizations charged with protecting Redania. And we have new aspiring archers here who can actually learn a great deal from the veterans of the God's Quiver. Meanwhile, we have over here on the opposite side of the main etherite crystal, which is actually here in New Gridania, we have the Knot. It's surrounded by water mills, and the Knot is a crossroads sitting ever so slightly askew. Near the etherite plaza, it connects Gridania's most traveled thoroughfares. So not really too much on this side here, just a few stalls that we see here, which is part of the Black Rabbit Traders. And you can actually go and purchase like a small variety of items here. But on the other side, we have the Adder's Nest. So the Adder's Nest was built anew after the devastation of the Calamity and serves as the headquarters for Gridania's Grand Company. We talked a great deal about that. And this is actually just their main headquarters for the main military might that we have of Gridania. 
Uh, otherwise, we have two other gates. The first one is known as the White Wolf Gate. It's another gate named for the mythical creature of the four cardinal directions. The White Wolf Gate leads to Berlin's Bridges. And beyond these, however, dwell some fearsome beasts of plenty, and the Wood Whalers do not permit travelers to pass through the egress freely. So this actually leads to another part of the Central Shroud bit with a little bit higher level monsters. So it's definitely not a place for new adventurers to go through. In fact, they don't even let you go through there until you're at least a level 30. So those are some of the main landmarks that we have for New Gridania. Not really too much, at least not compared to old Gridania, but then again it is much newer structure so there's not really going to be as much information about them as some of the other places. But let's go ahead and look into the second part of Old Gridania. So Old Gridania stands in the area of the Jaded Thick, cleared soon after the city-state's founding. The busy center of the city's commerce, it houses the Albany and Rosewood stalls, where can be found all manners of goods and shops famed throughout the realm, such as the Centaur's Eye and Fenier's Fineries. So let's go ahead and start with some of the landmarks here. The first off is the Ebony and Rosewood stalls, or I guess much more commonly known as the Marketplace. The name of these stalls stem from a fanciful local tale some hundred years in the past. When a child of the elementals perished, the rest of the spirits withdrew into themselves, stricken with grief. Soon Gridania was covered in a thick blanket of snow. As tree boughs froze and woodland creatures fled, the people grew disheartened. Seeking food for their parents, who had lost the will to live, a brother and sister entered the Twelveswood, and before long became separated in the dark. However, they carried an ebony zither and a rosewood pipe, and began playing to find one another. The beauty of the melody drew the elementals from their stupor and dispelled the cold that had settled over the wood. Soon life returned to Gridania, all thanks to the power of music. Very interesting because until I looked that up, I had no idea. So all this time, I had no clue that's where it got its name from. But that really is a beautiful story. And you can actually go through here, go ahead and finish doing all the manner of shopping. Especially if you are still new to the game, this really is a good place where you can practice crafting, go ahead, buy materials, buy gear, tools, weapons. It really is a nice place to be able to go out to. If you move up a little more to the north, we have West Shore Pier. Near the Wailing Barracks, West Shore Pier serves as a berth for the ferry, which weeds its way throughout the Whispering Gorge to finally disgorge passengers in the East Shroud. So this is actually a really good way to be able to get to the East Shroud. Normally you have to go through the Central Shroud to be able to get there, or if you just don't want to spend money on traveling to an Aether Ride, so this is probably the quickest way to get directly to the East Shroud. A little up here though, we have what's known as Black Boar Gate. So it's another of Gridania's egresses. The Black Boar Gate likewise comes from a mythical creature watching over the cardinal directions. Now, it is here, but the thing is, is that you won't be able to travel through this particular gate. So the reason for that is because it led originally to the West Shroud. Unfortunately, the West Shroud is no longer there and seems to have just been completely obliterated during the Calamity. So while the gate itself still stands, there's no possible way that you can actually use those or travel through it, so really not too much to worry about there. However, down here we have what's known as the Centaur's Eye. A family of dedicated buyers has owned this weapon shop for over 150 years, honing their considerable expertise through the generations. While the shop still specializes in archery, in recent years the inventory has grown to include lances and their like to better satisfy the demands of both wood whalers and outside adventurers. So you can actually go here and buy low level weapons. Again, it's really good for just beginner levels, so I wouldn't worry too much about that. And if you're still a new beginner and you're looking for a better weapon, I would definitely come here, especially if you are spending time in Gridania. If you move out to the west, however, going through a tunnel to be able to do so, it will take you to Akalul Falls. It's named after a failed attempt by an ambitious Gridanian merchant to hatch and breed Apkakus in the Lin. Apkakus Falls is most remembered for serving as a place of meditation for the late Louis Swa Lerier, Circle of Knowing Archon and Hero of Eorzea. It's also a frequent hangout of Yastola's sister Yamitra, who helps us with the summoner quest line. 
Moving downwards closer to the marketplace, we have both the Leather Workers Guild as well as Finya's Fineries. Along with the Sun Silk Tapestries and Udal, Finya's Fineries offer the highest of Eorzea's fashion. So popular are the leather goods of this store's best artists that customers commonly wait moons if not years between placing and receiving their order. So that's how famous it is. And I should probably warn you, if you do plan on coming here and becoming a leather worker, good luck. The Guildmaster isn't exactly kind about it, I guess you could say. But moving on, we have Mekito's Amphitheater. With her own coin, the famed minstrel Mekote raised this open-air amphitheater. Upon completion, she made a present of it to Gridania, her birthplace. After no small debate, scholars have concluded that the amphitheater's acoustics, which poise a quality unheard anywhere else in Eorzea, diverge from the ponds behind the stage. Which is a really nice feature, and it often is a main place for special or holiday events. Up a little bit from there, we have the Whistling Miller. Local history has it that the first owner of this mill secured the custom of passerbys with an airy whistle, hence the present day name. In addition to selections of finest rye and wheat flowers, the Whistling Miller does a brief trade in numerous cooking oils. Okay, so let's go ahead and move to the far western part of Old Gridania. It's not only the home to the Botanist Guild, it's also the Great Loam Growery. Home to some of the richest, most fertile soil in the Twelves Wood, for hundreds of summers this land was the private property of a defluent family of merchants. In an unexpected move of faith-inspired philanthropy, the family donated the acreage to Gridania in the name of the goddess Nofika. Currently, the Botanist Guild maintains the growery, doling out small parts of land to the most promising members of its order. So, it's a really beautiful place, and I would recommend going for the Botanist Guild. It's probably my favorite of the three of the gatherers. Okay, so we are getting there. We have only a few more locations. Let's go ahead by start by down here. This is the Yellow Serpent's Gate. It was raised after the Calamity, and the Yellow Serpent Gate is the newest addition to Gridania's main entrances. Following the tradition of the other gates, it is named after the mystical creature that keeps vigil over the meeting of the North, South, East, and West. So out of the four gates, it's the newest one, and it leads directly into the North Shroud. Over here, we have Nofika's Altar. It was devoted to the Matron. This altar consists of a great stone platter set within the hollow of an ancient tree. When celebrating plentiful harvests or festivals held in the Elemental's honor, Gridanias lay gifts of grain, fruit, meats, and fish in heaping piles before the shrine. So it's directly above the Conjurer's Guild. So you actually have to go through a little tunnel throughout this ancient tree to be able to get to the Conjurer's Guild. And this was also one of the original places where I guess the god Soulstone is set. So you had to travel here in order to be able to pray to the Twelve. That was before Louis Swan was able to use the power of the Twelve to be able to combat against Bahamut. Speaking of the Conjurer's Guild, we have Steel Glade Fan. Stretching forth between the roots of a mighty tree, Steel Glade Fan is a space for the quiet contemplation of conjurers. In the silence, many take to the alcoves of the cavern and burn exotic incenses to heighten their senses. In this, they seek to catch the whispering voices of the elementals that elude the common man. And just as an interesting bit of information, not all the hearers are Paija. Some of them are Hewans. We have a couple Elizin as well. And you can learn to train yourself to be able to listen to the voices of the forest. It does take a lot of patience, a lot of practice. And this place is really helps with that, with quiet meditation and help to really start to pick out the little voices of the forest. And finally, we have the Wailing Barracks, headquarters of the Wood Whalers. The Wailing Barracks holds a guardhouse, facilities where townsfolk might seek the Whalers' counsel, and a small jail for those criminals who disturb the peace of the Twelves Wood. This is actually inside the Lancers Guild. So the Lancers Guild is all the way up here, right next to West Shore Pier. And not only can you learn the power of how to use a lance, but you can actually lock away bad guys from in here. So that's pretty much everything basic about the city-state that we know of today. So they live in the forest, they are able to more than support themselves through the bounty of the forest, but they have very, very strict laws and how much they are allowed to take. So with that all taken care of, and we all discussed about that, let's go ahead into a quick sort of history of Gridania and how it became known as the city-state that we have today. 
So the forest there has been there for a very, very long time, but it wasn't until the later 7th century of the 6th Astral Era where the second migration of Huor came upon Eorzea, forcing Elizin from their lands and into the Black Shroud. The Elementals looked upon these settlers as intruders and sought to purge their presence from amongst the trees. Surviving accounts of this period describe chaos. The Elizins lacked knowledge of the Elementals' existence and knew not what attacked them. In time, they realized what had befallen their people and sought respire from the merciless onslaught of the caverns deep beneath the forest. They escaped annihilation, but at the cost of many Elizin lives. Fifty years later, population growth pushed the Hewer to enter the forest as well. Upon finding people already insecured underground, they challenged the Elizin for ownership of the habitable caves. Quarrels soon led to conflict, and the two races came to cross blades time and time again. So that was known as the Blood Between Men Age. But moving on, we have Gilmora. So this kind of underground city was built when the Elizins were forced underground. Though this conflict raged for decades between both the Elizin and the Huor, overtures towards peace had begun around the year 740. Realizing that they had a common goal in avoiding the Elemental's hostile gaze, the Huor and the Elizin put aside their differences. The two war-weary races sealed a pact that both might prosper beneath the Twelve's Wood. The fruit of their alliance was Gilmora, a great subterranean city. For nearly three centuries, the Elizin and the Huron labored to expand their home, burrowing between natural caves and shoring up the passages with walls of stone. In time, Gilmora's intricate network of tunnels would come to put any Atlang's nest to shame. Around the year 1020, however, a great change came over the Twelveswood. Since times of eld, the Elementals have allowed the Exel to live within their forest, yet suddenly they cast the Beastmen from the Shroud. What caused such a radical change in the Elementals? The commonly accepted reason is that the Exel population had grown too great for the era of the forest to support, and enlarging their territory they cleared new land without the Elementals' consent. For this defiance, exile was their reward. When the Gamorians learned that the Exile were kicked out of the Shroud, they realized that this was their chance to try to negotiate for land above ground. Those versed in the magic gathered, seeking a way to communicate with the Elementals through their art. For a very long time, the mages' attempts went unanswered. However, with perseverance came success. After 50 years of effort, they finally succeeded in relaying their wishes to the Elementals. On the understanding that the Gamorans would defend the forest, the Elementals gave them permission to return to the light of day. As a blessing and proof of the accord, they bestowed a glowing light upon Joran Lightheart, the Huron leader of the mages. Thus, the Gamorians abandoned the caves and began building a new home amidst the jagged thick. They christened this new city Gridania. Just as people were growing accustomed to their lives above ground, a child was born to the house of Joran. Curiously, this child had horns and never seemed to age beyond childhood, no matter how many years had passed. Most extraordinary of all, the child could hear the Elemental's thoughts and began to act as their emissary. With time, Gridanians came to realize the child was the selfsame blessing given to Joran, a bridge betwixt man and the Elementals. These horned beings became known as the Padja, and continued to be born to Huon houses on rare occasions. To this day, they serve as the honored leaders of Gridania. So I'm sure you've seen this, especially with the Conjurers. We have a few people who are actually born with these horns. Kane Sena is one of them. So people who are born with these horns are, I guess, blessed by the Elementals. They see great promise in them, they have great magical potential, and so they are blessed with these horns, as well as longevity, and be able to even hear the words of the Elementals. So while they are rare, it is super important whenever a Paja is born because it's considered to be a good thing. However, as for the Exali, after they were driven from the Black Shroud, the Exali settled in Selfotal along Alabathia's spine. Few trees grew in this barren wasteland, however, and not nearly enough to build a new settlement. Yet this was the least of their troubles. Turns out that the Exali young who were born after they were exiled, their wings were stunted and none of them knew why. They were no longer able to fly, and the Exile could no longer hunt as they once had. Their new lives then were characterized by scarcity and suffering. To escape such hardships, the Exile began to consider the return to the Twelveswood. Around the year 1360, the tribe united and marched onto the Shroud, intending on felling timber. The Wood Whalers met their advance and repulsed the invaders after a pitched battle. However, the Gridanian's victory was hard-fought and claimed many lives. This spurred the woodland city-state to create the God's Quiver, 
an elite force charged with watching for foreign incursions into the forest. Aside from a couple skirmishes here and there on the outside of the borders, things remained relatively peaceful for about another hundred years or so. At least until the Autumn War. In the year 1468 of the Sixth Astral Era, King Manfred of Alamigo suddenly laid claim to the East Shroud. He raised a mighty army and ordered it to cross the Velodanya River, the true border of Gridania. In haste, Gridania sent its wood whalers and God's quiver against the invaders. They met with the first battle of Tanakwa, where Alamigo triumphed over the defenders and routed the Gridanians to the Five Hangs. In the face of crisis, Gridania entreated the other city-states of Eorzea to dispatch their armies. Since assuming the throne, Manfred's unconcealed hunger for land had not gone unnoticed by Ishgard, Udal, and Limsa so by the year 1969, these three answered Gridania's calls with a great army. Reinforcements at its rear, Gridania rallied and drove the invading army back to the east end. There, in the Second Battle of Tanakwa, the Allied forces slew General Galbard of Alamigo and Gridania was victorious in defending its borders. This is known as the Autumn War, and its conflict demonstrated to the realm that Gridania had answered the Elemental's call and stood ready to defend the Twelve's Wood from all intruders. Nevertheless, its more recent times, Alamigo has fallen into the hands of the Garlean Empire and Gridania has done little to halt the Imperial advance. At present, the fate of the Woodland City-State has grown uncertain. So that there is a very basic history of Gridania and how it came to be. So it really is quite an interesting story. Now, it started off because no one could enter the Black Shroud because of the Elementals and how they pretty much took care of anyone who dared to threaten their forests. The Ellison were then forces seek underground, later joined by the Huor, and getting tired of all the fighting, they came to an alliance, they built a vast underground network of Gamora. Once the Exali were banished, they were able to come up and really start to build what would be later known as Gridania. It is said that the reason that the Exali are no longer able to fly is because the Elementals kind of placed a curse on them, so that their wings are stunted, they're not able to fly. So the Exali were once born being able to soar, but because they ran afoul of the Elementals, now they have to rely upon airships to be able to fly again. And to this day, it seems that they do still consider trying to reclaim everything. They still want to take back their forest home, but of course the Elementals are not really known for forgiveness. Okay, so let's look here to the main army that we have here in Gridania, which is the Order of the Twin Adder. So, amidst concerns of the Garlean threats, Gridania decided to raise its own Grand Company in 1572. It's a choice spurred by advance from the Circle of Knowing, and the Elder Seed Seer, Kane Sena, returned from her communication with the Elementals in the Twelves Wood so that she might directly oversee this body. Kane Sena's quiet strength as leader of the Order of the Twin Adder has allowed her to keep Gridania's citizens safe and take command of matters involving the military. The Order of the Twin Adder gives its name from the two entwined serpents emblazoned on the Gridanian's flag and carries the same meaning of unity. Some question, however, whether the symbol does justice to Gridania's inhabitants, many of whom are not Elizan or Hyor. At one point, critics from other races voiced their objections and asked that the Grand Company consider other sigils. Ultimately, however, Gridania adopted the name and symbol because they wished to raise a flag that flew victorious in the Autumn War. This historical allusion also brings to mind the aid of Limsa Lamensa, Udal, and Ishgard in hopes that such a great alliance might again come to pass. Alright, so that is us wrapping up everything that we know about Gridania. It's a lot of information, I know, and there is still a lot more left. I mean, I do think I'll be doing occasional lore videos later on once I complete my Lore of the Realm series and probably going more into details about the different organizations, different guilds, and everything throughout all these realms. But that's a far off distance from there. So it was a little bit of a surprise that we found out that N. Walker is going to be delayed, but I kind of now see that as a little bit of a blessing, so I have more time to be able to work on several videos. And I do plan on completing all of Gridania, so if you're interested and you want to find out more about the Twelves Wood, in next week's video, it will be going up next week by the way, we are going to be covering both the Central and the Eastern Shroud. 
And then the week after that, we'll be doing a, another video which will cover both North Shroud and South Shroud and, of course, the Lavender Beds. And if I have time, I will definitely go ahead and add in more Dona as its own separate video before the launch of Ed Walker. So anyway, that's it for right now. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope that you enjoyed it and you'll be looking forward to what comes next. So until next time, everyone, take care and have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye.